Hello everybody. Now I'll discuss uh, about the uh, cold working process. Cold working or uh, process or I can say the metal forming is basically happens at room temperature. So with the application of the energy and the, or maybe try to deform the one sample, then some amount of the energy is basically stored in the, in the form of internal energy. So that internal energy can be stored in the formation of the that by creating the generation of the dislocation. So how easily dislocation can move within the material it actually indicates the flow stress of this particular material now if there is obstacles to movement of the dislocation that means more amount of the stress is required uh, to move the dislocation it means that there is a strain hardening effect associated with this uh, plastic deformation of the material so of course this internal energy store due to the application of the or maybe due to the formation of the pl uh, plastic deformation uh, when we apply any kind of the mechanical load uh, of, a, of a particular sample. Now here if you look into this figure, so cold working basically at room temperature, see there is a lots of dislocation can be generated. So we see this is the, uh, we can say this is in, in the form of dislocation. So dislocation generated and uh, see dislocation density in the certain area the, near the grain boundary, the dislocation density is more. Now if with the application of the further plastically deform the sample, then dislocation will try to move but at certain point of time the uh, movement of the dislocation is basically restricted so in that case we need more amount of the stress to further movement of the dislocation so this is happens because of the the strain hardening effect of this uh, material so we can simply the ease of the dislocation movement is basically representation of the uh, flow stress value uh, during the plastic deformation of the material now this flow stress can be related to the dislocation density using this particular formula we see that uh, the flow stress value equal to sigma 0 some constant value plus k square root of uh, rho d rho d is the basically indicates the dislocation density so we, we see that flow stress depends on the dislocation density and sigma 0 k are the constant and it uh, depends on the type of the uh, material and from this figure we can see that uh, strength versus cold work we see there is a the elongation is basically with the increase increment of the uh, strength and the further cold work so initial level the elongation is very high so we can easily deform the material but gradually when dislocation density increases then elongation level actually gradually decreases but when elongation level gradually decreases or i can say that dislocation movement is more difficult to movement of the dislocation the yield strength is actually increases or tensile strength also increases with increasing the uh, amount of the cold work uh, to this particular uh, sample so large amount of the cold work uh, means the large amount of the energy store this thing and uh, more dislocation density creates and then uh, when more dis dislocation density that means more dis more dislocations are available then it's a very difficult to to freely movement of the uh, dislocation so all this basically reduces the elongation with increasing the cold work but it increases the strength tensile strength or yield strength of this material now degree of cold work can be calculated by using this thing what is the uh, this uh, area initial cross section area and after deformation plastic cross section with respect to the initial cross section area into 100 that actually measure of the the cold work similarly the rise of the strength properties is also due to the strain hardening we see already mentioned this thing rise of the strength that means strength increases means more difficult to movement of the dislocation it because of the strain hardening effect what is the fall of the ductlet is due to the store in release of the energy that makes the difficult to further uh, deformation of the in the uh, cold work so up to certain level then uh, once it is this uh, elongation level reach up to that minimum level further it is very difficult to deform the material because in that may be result of the fracture happens to the sample now cold work of the material strain hardening or in the cold work basically results in the more strain hardening uh, with the material or many strain hardening effect is much more means in the in this case with the further increase of the cold work there is increasement of the hardness and strength but at the same time reduction in the ductility we have already made seen this part but difficult to deform further cold work material and this difficult is overcome by treating the cold work material by handling so sometimes we see when the cold work deformed grains has been created large amount of dislocation density has been created but if we perform the annealing operations uh, then cold work material uh, there some amount of the energy will be released and it's actually restored the ductility of the material uh, and uh, with the application of the the annealing process so therefore if you see most of the forming operation we usually perform the intermediate process we can or after the process we perform the annealing operation just to restore the ductility with the compromise of the strength that is the purpose of doing the ductility in the cold work or maybe in the uh, in any kind of the metal forming operation now 
we represent this the cold work in terms of the different way one is the recovery recrystallization and grain growth so recovery is that release of the stored energy and uh, maybe rearrangement of the uh, dislocation such that it can neutralize the amount of the energy uh, associated with the uh, with the dislocation so that is called the we can say the release of the stored energy or in in, in this case it actually eliminates the residual stress by rearranging the dislocation for example this is uh, the um, this uh, right hand screw dislocation or left hand screw dislocation and basically when it comes together form together they can neutralize their effect so that is one example so this way this recovery usually happens uh, during the deformation for some part of the energy is the basically restored in the form of a uh, recovery so here you can see that during the work hardened the max amount uh, amount of the energy is stored then uh, it's basically work uh, total amount of the energy is stored then some amount of the energy is, is basically uh, recover which is the known as the recovery and the remaining amount of the energy is, is basically released in the form by formation of the new recrystallized grain. So, this recrystalline gas is almost strain free gains and gradually the store of the energy is released much during the recrystallization and further it is more or less remains constant when there is a grain growth happens. But we see that these steps the strength and hardness all having the similar trend and uh, with respect to time. But uh, if you see there is a formability, formability means that the work hardened material uh, is the this when it is already stored energy then it is very difficult to further movement of the material that means the ductility is very low when material becomes work hardened. But during the recrystallization phase it gradually restores the ductility and reach certain level then formability means basically increase the ductility it means the enhancement of the formability of this particular material. So, it is in this at this stage uh, after finishing of the recrystallization formation of the new grains probably it is having the more ductility and then formability much more uh, at this particular stage. Now, once we do recovery then recrystallization is basically is the I already mentioned that it is a formation of the new grains, uh, new strain free grains and by releasing the store internal store energy and that is known as the recrystallized gain. So, basically uh, recrystallization process what the recrystallization happens on particular temperature and it also a function of the strain rate and uh, that is why all these factor the different types of the recrystallization usually occurs. So, it is a simply rearrangement of the uh, grains or new grains and it is should be smaller in size also uh, uh, in, uh, in recrystallized grain. So, basically once after recrystallization we can expect the more or less uniform grain size here and the, that grain size becomes smaller. Strength is also high because the we see the whole patch equation the strength also depends on the uh, size of the grain. So, from that sense as per the whole patch equation the strength becomes much more when fine grain structure is formed after recrystallization in a cold working process. And degree of cold work we already mentioned uh, this uh, temperature but recrystallized temperature is not we cannot say like melting temperature we cannot fix one particular temperature as a recrystallization temperature. So, recrystallization temperature can vary and uh, it is not a constant for a material and it depends on the uh, degree of cold work and it depends on the what is the annealing time performing this operation and what are the and uh, different other factors. So, strain rate we are using uh, in this particular process what type of the material all this all this actually uh, relates with the recrystallization temperature. Usually recrystallization temperature is basically one third to the half of the melting point temperature of a particular material. So, we have already mentioned the recrystallization means uh, new formation of the new grain, but in this case it is also follows the same the nucleation and the uh, grain growth this particular two phases. So, nucleation small nucleation happens, but it happens in the solid state. So, nucleation happens where the dislocation de uh, density is very very high and it is it when it cross the critical critical values of the dislocation density at this particular point the new nucleation usually forms. And then one nucleation forms it gradually grow into a new grains and finally it reached to a completely strain free grains uh, is developed. But there may be depending upon the other external factor conditions temperature and strain rate and the deformation conditions this uh, recrystallized grain can grow. So, that we can consider as a, a growth stage. Now, 
This cold work grains are transformed to the equi usually equiaxed grains with some grain refinement due to the recrystallization. So basically recrystallization is performed just to attain the almost uniform size of the grain and strength free grains and which is smaller as compared to the initial or the uh, deformed grain. So that is why we say this is equiaxed grain is basically transformed. So this type of phenomenon is called the grain refinement and this usually happens when you perform the in the during the cold after the or during the cold working if we perform the annealing operations then we observe the recrystallization basically formation of the uh, refinement of the grains small grains usually forms now if you link thermomechanical processing and the recrystallization metal forming operation so we already mentioned that is the this actually happens together the recovery recrystallization and grain growth so it is very difficult to segregate in the individual uh, steps the recovery and recrystallization and grain growth phenomena and in this case this uh, this usually happens not only on the cold uh, deformation or, or after the cold work it may happen in during the hot deformation or, uh, or hot working condition of the material so already mentioned is to two step nucleation and the grain growth and key mechanism to control the nucleation is the during the hot working and subsequent heat treatment is the basically this uh, has depending upon the uh, different or you can explain that what way this uh, fine grain structure will form it depends on the dynamic recovery not exactly depends on it actually we can we can consider the different types of the this uh, recovery and recrystallization mechanism. One is we can say the dynamic recovery, dynamic recrystallization, you can say the static recovery, static recrystallization and grain growth usually occurs on this thing. So, but first we look into the dynamic recovery. So, dynamic recovery is usually occurs at relatively high temperature. So, basically rearrangement of the atoms or movement of the at movement of the dislocations uh, uh, to the towards the uh, grain boundary and of course in the dynamic recovery and this uh, lowers the strain energy so strain energy has been released or strain energy is lower by formation of the uh, dynamic recovery and at the same time it affects the effective rate of the work hardening effect actually reduced in the dynamic recovery stage now static recrystallization occurs after the deformation so on one we deform the material then after that stage the static recrystallization occurs and mostly in the cold working process is associated with the static recrystallization process but dynamic recrystallization usually occurs during the deformation process so during the deformation at the same time simultaneously dynamic recrystallization occurs and this dynamic recrystallization is mainly associated with the hot forming operation so that means hot working process or hot forming process Similarly, we are talking about the dynamic recovery and it might be we can categorize as a static recovery also and which is basically associated with the uh, cold working process or cold forming process. Now, once recrystallization occurs then uh, strain free grain then it try to further grow that is called the growth uh, grain growth stage. So, it refers to the increase the average size of the uh, grains when it is located beyond the completion of the recrystallization. So, once you complete recrystallization then competitive growth usually occurs in, in, a, in a metal structure and there is a significant loss of the tensile strength. Growth stage is basically significant loss of the tensile strength and the hardness due to the grain growth. So, grain growth is so smaller grain to the bigger grain. So, usually associated with the grain growth but in this case there is a loss of the tensile strength and the loss of the hardness in the growth, grain growth stage. But grain growth is basically movement of the dislocation uh, grain boundary and which is result in the reduction of the grain boundary area. So, we can see that from smaller grain to bigger grain this basically there is a movement of the uh, grain boundary. So, a metal consists of small grains has a large surface energy. So, small grains associated with the large surface energy are the large grain boundary area for volume. So, we can count this thing in the same material volume we can see in this case when it is filled with a small grain and other cases when it is filled with the same area filled with the large grain. So, when it is filled in the small grain then total surface grain boundary uh, area will be much more. But when it is bigger grain filled with the, uh, the same sample size then in that cases grain boundary will be less. So, large surface I think small grain having the large surface energy as compared to the bigger grain for the area of the sample. So, therefore, this large amount of the surface energy is, uh, is material is provide the driving force for the grain growth. So, when small grains are available in your samples and that actually driving force for the grain growth because there is a curvature, the, the curvature effect is there. So, that curvature effect brings the driving force 
for the uh, large amount of the surface energy and that will try to move the grain boundary and um, through the grain boundary movement the grain growth phenomena usually occurs. Now we can explain the different way the grain growth phenomena. So in the starting from the formation of the nuclei, we say that favorable position that means nucleation occurs in a basically the particular position that is the which is called the slip line intersection, twin intersection and usually grain boundary because at this particular position the dislocation density usually much more. So that part the nucleation occurs and then after that once uh, it very uh, it cross the critical values of the critical energy for the nucleation then after that it will try to grow. Now grain growth is basically depends on the grain boundary uh, energy and the curvature of the boundary it depends on this thing. So if we say the grain growth is basically dd by dt that d is the basically size of the grain which is proportional to the, the curvature rho, rho is the curvature. So we can say that k into 1 by d. So, curvature is basically here curvature is equivalent to the uh, 1 by d that means the di, uh, 1 by uh, diameter. So, that indicates the curvature. So, basically if we follow this equation and from there we can get the uh, integration we can get the d square equal to kt by c t is the here t is the time. So, we can see that uh, if we put it the initial conditions uh, that if at t equal to 0 initial grain size d equal to d0 then we can see that t equal to basically uh, d0 square. So, here by putting the c equal to d0 square we reach this expression. But here we can see that when d0 is very small, so that means initial grain size is very small basically is it reach to the d square equal to kt or you can say d equal to k dot square root of t. It means that the size of the grain depends on the it depends on the square root of the time. But actually it is a hardly uh, follow this equations but this nature of the equation can be modified. So in, in reality that it follows this d to the power n minus d0 to the power n equal to kt. This is the in reality these are the equations but here k and n is the time independent constant and usually n greater than equal to 2. So that means it is valid for 2 even it is more even it is more than 2 this equation is uh, valid. So this are the simple way we can represent the grain growth as a function of time. Now if we look into the recrystallization kinetics that how recrystallization occurs and what we can measure the recrystallization fraction that we can express in this way. So recrystallization fraction is basically when converting uh, from the old grain to new grain, new grain through the recrystallization mechanism. So we can count that how much percentage of the old grain is consumed by the new grain. So that that is the measure of these things. For example, if 50 percent uh, recrystallization, the recrystallization fraction is 50 percent or recrystallization fraction is, is equal to 0.5. It means that only 50 percent is converted to, to the uh, 50 percent area is converted to the new recrystallized grain and remaining 50 percent as the old deformed grain in this process. Now, we can simply we can, uh, we can express the recrystallization kinetics like that. For example, nucleation period we are assuming equal to T0 and n equal to rate of nucleation r equal to mean radius of the spherical grain we are assuming the spherical spherical grain. So, therefore, r equal to can be represent the g into t minus t0 where g is the growth rate. Growth rate is basically change of radius with respect to time dr by dt is indicates the growth rate. So, therefore, the r is the mean radius at a particular time t is basically g equal to t minus t0 because here t0 is there because we are assuming over the time period t0 the nucleation occurs. So, new, once the nucleation occurs, nucleation over, then it will follow the growth stage. So, that way count the time t minus t0, t is the any intermediate time. For example, t can be uh, this any intermediate time. So, I can say with reference to the uh, t0, I can say, say it is t0 up to this point, it is t0. So, nucleation occurs and suppose this is the time t at particular time t. So, here we can say this from this stage to this is the growth stage uh, of the already nucleated grain over the time period of the t0. So, that is why it represents the r equal to the, the radius mean radius of the spherical grain the growth rate into time. So, once we get it then we can calculate the recrystallized uh, volume fraction. So, recrystallized volume fraction x uh, uh, can be uh, like that. So, say rate of the nucleation that means per unit time what is the uh, number of nucleation usually form. So, n equal to n into dt is basically number of nucleation over the time dt. And now, if this is the number of nucleation each and each nucleus is having the spherical in shape. So, suppose at this point of time the radius of the nucleus is r. So, 4 by 3 pi r to the, the volume of the one, one particular nucleus. So, in multiply number of nucleus that it indicates this is the total uh, recrystallized volume uh, fraction. This is the volume one volume of the one, one grain uh, 
and this is the number of grain. So that actually indicates the recrystallization volume fraction. Now, this recrystallization volume fraction we can we can count it starting from the T0 to T, T0 to T because for example, over the time T0, there is a n number of rate of the nucleus is equal to a, n. Now we start the this counting time from T0 to T. And, and from T0 to from this point to this time, we can count the recrystallized uh, volume fraction here. So, you see that n 4 by 3 pi r cube and r equal to basically we already mentioned the r equal to g into t minus t0. So, here we put the t minus t0 cube into dt. So, from here we can reach this expression. Now, you can see the nucleus and in this case you can see n equal to rate of the nucleus and g equals to growth rate. These are the parameters are available and t time at any particular time we can calculate what is the values of the recrystallized fraction. But in practical this equation is valid when t0 is very very small. So, when t0 is very small x equal to 4 by 3 n into g cube into t to the power 4 and it and in, in actual practice. So, it is not like that a nucleation occurs the all nucleation occurs over the time period t0. So, nucleation can happen uh, in the throughout this uh, deformation it might happen also. So, therefore, this equation is valid if x is very very small, we can utilize this equation to calculate what is the recrystallized volume fraction uh, in a metal forming operations. And here you see that what way uh, we usually happen the initial stage there is a nucleation happens, intermediate stage there is a growth happens and then impingement means there is a there is a competition uh, between the two grains which one is, is you try to grow that is called the impingement between the these grains usually happens in the latter stage. Now, if we uh, John Johnson Mihal equation, so to predict the better way the recrystallized volume fraction we can refer the 1 minus exponential minus pi by 3 n g cube t to the power 4. So, which is, we use this expression, but here the different way this is the more refined forms to calculate the recrystallized volume fraction uh, during the metal forming operations. But in this case we see that the assumptions grains are spherical in nature we are assuming this is the one thing and rate of growth and nucleation rate are constant is not varying. Nucleation time is actually very small and randomly uh, distributed. So, based on this assumption we can say this is the roughly you can calculate what is the recrystallized volume fraction at a particular time t. Now, overall you can say that higher temperature of the working that means it is a hot working process the lower will be the energy will be the store which will lead to the higher recrystallization temperature. So, basically at the high temperature application or hot working process the recrystallization temperature will be higher side. Rate of recrystallization we can see that almost is the exponential function of the temperature, but since recrystallization is the very complex one the activation energy for the recrystallization cannot be treated as a fundamental. Uh, constant here. So, basically we see uh, that uh, we start that when calculate the recrystallized volume fraction we can say the recrystallized it actually is a strong function of the exponential function of the temperature and we can say the recrystallization occurs once the uh, this activation energy uh, that the recrystallization started the because it needs some amount of the energy barrier to overcome to start the nucleation process, but that energy barrier is actually not constant, it is not a fundamental constant, it depends on the uh, other parameters. Similarly, rate of recrystallization increases with amount of the cold, even there is a more amount of the cold work is there. So, very quickly the rate of recrystallization is usually much more. Then of course, on this cases the critical amount of the cold work is required to start the uh, recrystallization. So, uh, always necessary to start the recrystallization process we need some critical amount of the energy is required to start the nucleation process. Now, overall we can say the recrystallization is basically easier in pure metal uh, than in alloy, alloy and at occurs at the uh, lower temperature in, in case of the pure metal the recrystallization occurs relatively at the lower temperature. Recrystallization temperature also depends on many variables and it is not a fixed a temperature like melting point temperature in a material. It depends on the so many parameters. So, we cannot say it is a kind of material property like a melting point temperature for the recrystallization temperature. So, smaller original cold work grain size reduces the recrystallization temperature. So, usually initial phase the if the grain size is smaller that actually reduces the recrystallization temperature, but increasing the annealing time more uh, this annealing perform over a long period of the time this actually reduces the recrystallization temperature. So, these are the fact about the the overall recrystallization and then uh, the how to define the recrystallized temperature or what way the recrystallized temperature is affected. Now, if we look into that hot working process, uh, in this case uh, we see that it is a 
perfectly plastic material when try to the plastic material try to deform at hot working at, at particular high temperature now in this case strain hardening exponent n equal to the equal to zero and cold working is not feasible the metal must be form of the the hot working process so that means when there is a perfectly plastic material and where strain hardening exponent equal to zero uh, in that case so basically cold working is not feasible in that cases we try to must follow the hot working process the stock material prior to the rolling operation is at a temperature actually remarkably above the recrystallized temperature which is why the grains are actually equi-axed. So temperature is above the recrystallized temperature when uh, prior to the rolling operation when it the temperature is above the recrystallized temperature then always try to form the equi grain. On rolling the crystals tend to become the elongated in the rolling direction. We can see when it we perform the uh, hot working hot rolling operation we see this is the almost equiex kind of the structure of average grain size is bigger here now hot rolling process when you try to deform it the it's in this case is deform an elongated grain along one direction but once in this particular position the new grain is easily forms so when it creates the favorable condition to recrystallization to occurs then elongated grain in converted to the very fine recrystallized grain so therefore hot rolling process which is comp completed and resulting in the very refined equiex grain associated to the hot working or hot rolling operation now if we look into the comparison between the hot versus cold working process it is like that the cold working we can see that advantage is the enhanced strength cold working better surface finish we can achieve no preheating required suitable for the ductile material but if you say the advantage look into the hot working process you got the force requirement is less in this case because strength is actually reduces suitable for the high strength alloy when the high strength alloy we, leave, we need when you try to perform the cold working process for the high strength alloy we need much more amount of the load so which is not suitable here so in this case it's suitable for the high strength alloy we need to perform the hot working operation no additional annealing process is required in way because hot working condition itself act as a uh, condition for the annealing to occur so that's why in certain hot working conditions we may not be required the annealing operations but disadvantage of the cold working is the loss of ductility large amount of the loss of ductility might happen during the cold work and will reach large amount of the force so additional processing of the recrystallized annealing so we can perform the uh, again uh, the annealing process is required in cold working process just to release the stored energy and suitable for the forming high strength alloy unsuitable not suitable exactly so high strength alloy cold working process is not suitable in that cases we need to go for the hot working operations required the preheating is required in hot working process that is the disadvantage because we need to heat the sample up to certain temperature so that's why preheating is required surface piece is just fair not exactly the very because it's a hot uh, at a high temperature we perform the deformation operation so we cannot get the very smooth surface in case as compared to the uh, cold working process we cannot expect so here so surface is not exactly very smooth and then scales oxide layer may be formed that is another because affinity to oxide actually increases at the high temperature so when you heat the sample at the high temperature so it may form the oxide layer so that may be a part of the this uh, metal working process and it it may create the defect associated with the met metal forming operation until unless we prevent to form the oxidation at high temperature so these are the different advantage and disadvantage associated with the hot and cold working process. So I think that's all. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Mm -hmm.